Welcome everybody to our PyMC Labs webinar. Uh, today, I'm very excited to have as our guest speaker, Robert Ness. Uh, Robert is a researcher at Microsoft Research, and he has done a lot of work on causal reasoning, deep probabilistic modeling, language models, and programming language in general. Also written several books uh, and has an AI learning platform of deep.ai. So, as you can tell already, he fits very well into the, the Bayesian causal inference that we've been talking a lot about at Pimes Labs recently, uh, but also, of course, in this webinar series. So, yeah, very excited to have him. Uh, welcome, Robert. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, to get started, I'd be curious to hear how you uh, got into Bayesian inference and then causal inference and why you, those resonated particularly well for you, like what are particular problems that you were able to solve with this, but not other methods. And uh, because what I also think is really interesting is you also have a, a fairly deep background in AI and machine learning. Uh, so how, how you come down between those two approaches. Sure, I think, um, so I got into causality. So I, I did my PhD in statistics and, you know, from, I think right away I was um, very attracted to kind of computational Bayes, um, by far like my 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 favorite approach to to statistical modeling. So it was that, and then with respect to causality, I um, I my advisor had had done a lot of work on computational proteomics, um, Olga Vitek at Northeastern University, and she. Um, was interested in possibly exploring systems biology. So systems biology is a place where you kind of build top-down models of, um, you know, uh, molecular uh, processes such as, you know, gene, um, gene, gene uh, genetic um, networks, uh, signal transduction and protein networks, um, you know, whole cell models of organisms. And and you know, I was interested in this, you know, this very mechanistic approach to modeling that you don't really see in statistics or machine learning. Um, but but I was interested also in ways that you know, as as you know, while you can make a top down model, you can also perhaps do some you know, train the parameters on on data. And and so I think you know, you probably see where this is going. You know, a lot of people in the probabilistic programming community, have, you know, do do this type of thing with, say, for example. Uh, PKPD models, for example, like kind of taking the structure of the model comes from physics or from biochemistry or something, and then the parameters are inferred using Bayesian techniques. And I'd come across some work by a woman named Karen Sachs, who had done, uh, who has showed how you could use uh, causal discovery algorithms, so the algorithms that uh, were used to learn DAGs uh to uh to reverse engineer signaling pathways from um uh, a type of uh, uh protein measurement data where you have lots of cell level replicates so this is called uh, flow cytometry data and and so I was you know this was cool this was what I thought was causal inference at the time where like you 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 kind of uh given some data and some some causal assumptions, you can try to reverse engineer a causal uh, graph from uh, from data. And so here was a here's a way of of using these 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 techniques to these causal discovery techniques to reverse engineer these signaling pathways uh, from uh, from data. And and I got in, and I started combining those with Bayesian techniques because I, 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 you know, I actually ended up meeting Karen Sachs. We we had a collaboration and we were thinking about, okay, it's one thing to kind of infer these DAGs, but you don't know if you have ground truth or not. So how do you how do you actually incorporate this into a, a workflow? So we uh, hashed out this kind of Bayesian active learning approach, right, where you would um, uh, essentially design a set of sequential experiments that would reduce. Uh, that would kind of select interventions to run in an experiment and reduce uncertainty in a DAG through sequential experiments, and and so that's what that was kind of my first introduction to to Bayes and to causality as 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 things that could play well together. And at the same time, so this was when Stan was coming out, and uh, I had already been kind of working with Jags, and 
it was clear to me that um, you know, probabilistic programming, particularly with some of these, the, the more functional approaches to it, like you had at the time with, um, um, and uh, the names are escaping me, but um, uh, several kind of probabilistic programming libraries from the um, computer science world, particularly the programming language world, that were inspired very them. much by computational psychology, like how can we build models that emulate some reasoning process in humans? And so, uh, and so this led to tools like th these, some, some of these tools were the ideological ancestors of uh, Pyro, for example. And, and at the same time, you looked at the causal inference literature and people were focused on causal effects. They were moving, uh, moving away from kind of causal graphical models. Even, even Pearl himself, who had, uh, you know, got the Turing Award for his work on, 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 on Bayesian networks and, and uh, had uh, since developed a lot of the core theory behind graphical causality, uh, his, he wasn't fitting generative models and then doing causal inferences with them, that he just wasn't talking about that. I mean, I think it was clear to him that you could do that. Um, uh, and the do calculus is kind of a theory of, of that abstracts a lot of that away. But, um, but nobody was just doing it. Nobody would say, hey, we have this Pi MC or we have this Stan or we have this Pyro, let's implement a causal graphical model here and start doing inferences. Um, and especially in industry. So I was interested immediately. I, I never really wanted to work in academia. I wanted to work in industry. And when you looked at what people in industry were doing with causality, it was economists essentially who were doing potential outcomes, i.e. kind of uh, uh, graph light versions of, of uh, causal inference. And so, um, and they were interested in and average treatment effects, conditional average treatment effects, which at the time I didn't know that was actually what most people were doing in causal inference. I was like, well, nobody's, I thought, I thought causal inference was learning, was learning DAGs. And so, um, uh, yeah, so I went, when I went to work at an in industry, I was working in, in roles where I was implementing essentially models for decision making under uncertainty using, using probabilistic modeling, probabilistic programming approaches. And um, it was, and then at the, at the same time, I was kind of continuing to kind of try to integrate this intuition behind kind of Bayesian modeling and all of the powerful things you can now do with uh, probabilistic programs. I mean, in probabilistic programs, you can do for loops, you can do recursion, you can do all of these things. What does that mean from a causal standpoint? So everything is kind of fixed to a graph. Um, and at the same, and so I was trying to reconcile a lot of these ideas that had been kind of writing papers and trying to publish in my spare time. Microsoft Research finally was a place where I could kind of do, the bo do both of those things at the same time. Um, that's, a, that's kind of you know, how I ended up here. Very cool. Yeah, and, and so interesting to get you also your historical perspective. It sounds like you were one of the very first to really think about like causality in Bayes and, and seeing that gap, right? Where like, well, they, uh, they want to do, I think, the same thing, but they're not somehow, and there's this gap, which uh, just so exciting to me is that we're now finally being able to close this with adding these capabilities to probabilistic programming packages uh, like PyMC and Pyro. Um, so uh, very interesting uh, background and uh, makes me even more excited for the presentation. So feel free to take it away. Yeah, um, and also, and also, you had mentioned the AI, you know, AI large language models, uh, just general AI stuff. And I think and there's a lot of the things that I've been focusing on more recently has been you know, how do how can some of the insights we bring from causality be applied to some of these models, which we know, well, as powerful as they are, often uh, go off the rails when it comes to making to causal reasoning or causal inferences. And so, uh, this is this this kind of background has really helped. I mean, there's even work with how do we implement um, uh, uh, large language, how do we combine large language models with probabilistic programming? So the idea is like, you know, rather than having a prior, like a normal, a Gaussian or a, or a, uh, a beta distribution, you can have it, you can just have it sample from a large language model, given a specific prompt that's saying, hey, just, you know, generate common sense outcomes from that, that fit these, these parameters and just sample them. 
and then use the lo the logits from the model to give you log props, and then just applying your your, your regular um, inference algorithms. And so that that's there's all there's all there's all manner of crosstalk in this area. So it's a really fun time to be in the field. Yeah, okay. I I couldn't agree more, uh, and especially that uh, link. So maybe after you talk, we can have some more discussion of those links between LMs, which um, super cool, um, and and how we can use probabilistic programming to add more causal capabilities and probabilistic capabilities. Um, and uh, so for everyone here, thanks uh, for joining again. And feel free to ask questions as they come up in the Q&A uh, box, and then we'll get to them at the end of the talk. Uh, but yeah. And how long do we have? Um, I guess until the full hour. Um, and maybe a few, I'll leave some time for questions. Um, all right, try so this well. is so as we mentioned, I teach about this stuff at alti.ai. You guys are welcome to visit that. Um, and a lot of the things that I'm talking about in this lecture you can find in my book. It's still in early, uh, still being still being edited. The, the chapters are done, but we're uh, going through some technical edits. But that'll be out soon. You can get early release on at this website. Um, so let's we'll start with an example, right? So I just simple DAG here for online gaming. I have guild membership, whether or not a player belongs to a guild, side quest engagement, how much a player engages in side quest, in-game purchases, which is how much virtual items a player buys, and one items, which is how much virtual items a player wins in the game. So guild, uh, guild membership drives how much you, in, you engage in side quests. Uh, side quests, the amount of side quests you do will in, in, impact how many items you win. And of course, you know, items that you win might encourage you to buy, make some purchases of more items, for example, that's uh, because maybe you want some, you win some magic arrows and now you want to buy some magic, a magic bow for those arrows, right? Um, similarly, um, you might uh, be encouraged to spend more on in-game uh, in -game virtual items if you belong to a guild because then you can share it amongst your uh, uh, guild, uh, your fellow members of the guild and get some kind of social cred amongst your peers. Um, we would implement something like this in PyMC uh, um, just like that. So it's not, it, well, it is a, the DAG is implicit in the structure of the program, right? So that's where, um, uh, you know, we can kind of see the DAG if we envision uh, which expressions depend on which expressions to get evaluated. But of course, you have this uh, model to graph this tool that will just show you that dependence straight away. Notice here, I haven't gone Bayesian yet. I'm just, my, my parameter is like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, hard-coded. And we're gonna talk about kind of what the causal inference looks like in a hard-coded setting. And then we're gonna bring in the parameter uncertainty and talk about Bayes. So the core idea in causal inference is this idea of at atomic intervention. Uh, so an atomic intervention, it targets a specific variable or set of variables, sets that variable to a specific value, and then severs that ca the causal influence of that variable's cause. And so this is, we have generalizations of this. We have uh, you know, stochastic interventions, uh, uh, fat-fingered interventions, for example. We have all, but what, all those are based on this basic, simple idea of the atomic intervention. Um, second, we have this, I'm gonna I have to int introduce some notation. Uh, it'll 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 help us understand the kinds of questions that we want to answer with these models. So bear with me. So we call this you know Pearl's causal notation. Basically, this intervention, this atomic intervention here, we're going to represent it as a subscript, right? So in this first case, I have this variable i for in-game purchases, random variable for how much purchases a player makes. I have i given e equals high. So this is so e here being side quest engagement. This is the amount of in-game purchases a player makes. Uh, uh, given high side quest engagement. And then I sub e equals high, which is what happens when we intervene. So here I'm going to say, I'm going to go in here and fix side quest engagement to a certain level and then consider what happens downstream of that. So I sub e equals high, in game purchases given intervention that sets side quest engagement to high. And we can rewrap these with that. With a, with a probability uh, P and uh, we have kind of probabilistic queries here. So the probability distribution of in-game purchases, P of I, the, prob the probability distribution of in-game purchases given 
high side quest engagement. So this is a conditional probability distribution. And then the probability distribution of I uh, sub equals high. In other words, the probability distribution of in-game purchases given an intervention that sets side quest engagement to high. So this is an interventional distribution. And we can combine these, right? So if I want to condition on, on G equals, you know, somebody's a guild member um, and uh, setting uh, engagement to high, we get this notation here. So this is, this is an alternative to the do notation, which I find a little bit easier to reason about. So one of the challenging things that we need to do in causal reasoning is, is think about the questions we want to ask and then map those to queries like this. So I call these these, these probabilistic, this, this P of I sub equals I or P of I here, I call those a query or a, probably, a probabilistic query. This is the kind of thing we want to infer using probabilistic inference on a, on a model. We want to sample from these distributions, in other words. So the the trick here is coming is 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 going from the question you want to ask to the query. So here I say, what are the what are in-game purchases for players where side quest engagement is high? That's uh, P of I given e equals high. Well, aggressive cat. Uh, second, uh, now one thing I found here. This is just a, my my personal advice. So when you're trying to do this, when you're trying to work with causal queries. It's it's easier to use the subjunct subjunctive mood. So like subjunctive mood is like would have, could have, should have. Um, it makes going from the question to the uh, query easier. There we can just do this with regular probability queries here. So so instead of saying what are in-game purchases for players where side quest engagement is high, I'm going to say what would in-game purchases be where side quest engagement is high. This where here is the key word that I'm going to that's going to key me in for when I want to condition on. Uh, um, e equals high, right? So where or, or, or when side quest engagement is high or in cases where side quest, in, 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 uh, side quest engagement is high or for players where side quest in, engagement is high. This is what we're, this is the language we're using when we want to filter to a subpopulation. We want to zoom in on some group of people. And, and so we use this, uh, this, this uh, conditioning here or conditioning on evidence or observations. Or I'm gonna call them actual facts and you'll see why later on when I talk about counterfactuals. Um, but so we're conditioning on evidence, observations, actual facts. It's analogous to, this is why we say where when we, when we, when we use SQL, right? We're saying, we're trying to filter the results uh, with some kind of uh, conditions, some constraints, some, some subpopulation of the full set of results. So in contrast to uh, what would in-game purchases be, where side quest engagement were, were set to high, uh, when it comes to hypotheticals, right? When I'm reasoning about hypothetical ideas, I'm going to use I'm going to use uh, well in language I, I might say if, right? And again, you know, with with natural language, it's kind of nebulous a little bit, but um, it, it, I'm going to just kind of just assume that we can kind of distinguish between cases where we want to say where and zoom in on some subpopulation and if where I'm just thinking about some kind of hypothetical. What I mean by hypothetical, I'm going to say, you know, if side quest engagements were high, this is a hypothetical conditions. I'm wondering what would happen if side quest engagements were high? What would in-game purchases be then? And uh, when humans reason about hypotheticals, they're attending to only the consequences of the hypothetical condition, right? So in other words, we look back at the deck, if I say where can, uh, where side quest is engagement is high, I know that that's going to tell me something about guild membership, right? Because maybe high self, self high side quest engagement implies that perhaps somebody is in a guild, right? But when it comes to what would happen if side quest engagement are high, I'm assuming from a cog size standpoint that I, I don't, I'm not thinking about uh, guild membership, I'm thinking only about the consequences of this hypothetical condition. So that's why in, uh, when we're reasoning causally with these what if questions, we use the intervention because the intervention, as we saw here, severs causal influence from the causes. And so we're, um, that's why, with, you know, when we hear people say, oh, yes, with what if questions, you use causality. Uh, that's what we mean here. We're saying that um, we're attending only to the consequences of the hypothetical condition. And so that's why we use this intervention subscript. And then finally, we have counterfactual queries, and these can be a little bit intimidating. But really, what they're just doing is we're just we're just it's a case where our actual condition, the variables in our actual conditions, the things on the right hand side of the bar, of the conditioning bar here, and the variables on the left hand side of the conditioning bar. So things like uh, the hypothetical condition or the hypothetical outcome. In this case, I. 
overlap, right? So if I said like, all right, in cases of guild membership and, and low site, so low site quest engagement, in-game purchases were low. These are actual facts, right? So I'm trying to zoom in on all of the players who are members of guild and had low site quest engagement and the game purchases were low. And I ask, you know, what would have what would in-game purchases be, right? So I'm I'm thinking about some hypothetical outcome in this case, in-game purchases, if side quest engagement were high. Uh, and so in other words, for these people who had low side quest engagement, what would their in-game purchases had, would be if their side quest engagement were high? Not only did they have low side quest engagement, but they also had in-game purchases of less than $50. And I'm wondering, you know, perhaps would their uh, in-game purchases have been greater than fifty dollars if their side quest engagement had been high, right? So this is the counterfactual notation, and the only difference between the interventional notation is that we have variables that appear on both sides of the bar, and so it, it, that that's all that's happening there. And so we, uh, that the factual condition, variables in the factual conditions in the hypothetical outcome and condition overlap. And so we've seen this idea, maybe if you read Pearl's book on Pearl's hierarchy, uh, on, on, what is it called? The Book of Why. Uh, you see this, this, this kind of uh, idea here of uh, the causal hierarchy, where at the bottom of the ladder, we have association, intervention, uh, second uh, rung of the ladder, we have uh, interventions where we ask kind of what if questions and counterfactuals, so-called imagining, retrospection, understanding, what if I had done something different? Um, uh, this is useful as a kind of illustration, and that's often how it's used, but it actually turns out since since this first came out in the Book of Why, people have actually formalized this as a formal hierarchy, and, and, and which means it comes with a whole bunch of math, mathematical analysis behind it. In other words, it's a it's a strict hierarchy and that we can kind of use to categorize different concepts, right? So let's start with the queries, right? So these queries that like these, these various probability queries that I just defined, things like conditional probabilities, joint probabilities without any subscripts, they're association level. Um, when we're looking at um, oops, uh, uh, subscripts, so this should be actually a subscript here, uh, forgot to use a subscript here, but probability of I given, e, uh, given sub, sub E equals high, probability of I sub E equals, e equals high given G because remember these are interventional queries and they, they go on level two. Causal effects, so average treatment effects, conditional average treatment effects, these are also level two queries, right? They're based on interventional distributions. We're taking expectations. So here's the average treatment effect, conditional average treatment effect. Um, and then counterfactual queries, um, I'm gonna, I'll just roughly split these into two types, one where they're, the outcome is not overlapping on both sides of the bar. So here we have the actual condition overlapping with the hypothetical condition. So probability of I given equals low, uh, I sub E equals low given E equals high. Um, this is useful for queries such as the effect of treatment on the treated, which is often used in policy analysis. Um, and then cases where the outcome overlaps. So here we have I on both sides of the bar. So E equals high, I is less than 50, um, uh, probability of I given E equals low. So an I appears here and here. So that's overlapping of outcome. Uh, things like regrets, so counterfactual kind of regrets, like you might use in a regret minimiz minimization algorithm in bandits or in sequential decision-making reinforcer learning. That's, um, uh, uh, that's that type of query on a, thir a third level, um, uh, uh, of the third level of the causal hierarchy. Data also falls on different levels. So observational data on level one, experimental data on level two, counterfactual data on level three. What is counterfactual data? It means you're observing both what happened and what could have happened. Obviously, that's not something that we obviously we 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 can usually observe without access to the multiverse. Um, but there are cases where we can simulate counterfactual data. So in cases, for example, where we're where we're actually modeling data that's generated from some mathematical model or process model, rule-based system, um, such as ODEs, Clement models, systems biology models, game engines. Um, uh, you know, a lot of these models that we use, process models, climate models, industrial level simulators that we use in industry are actually very complicated. And you would there's no way of kind of writing down some analytical form of that model. So you could just simulate data from it and then try to model that data. Um, 
so, or generally any 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 anywhere where you can uh, generate data with and, and fix the exogenous conditions, such as setting a random seed. Uh, so, for example, um, and some analysis of so-called counterfactual data with uh, data from uh, 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 allocation in in cloud services. So, uh, you know, these are when you allocate resources in the cloud environment. There's there's a strict strict set of rules uh, that uh, that that um, assign uh, that allocate based on the conditions at, at, at a given time. And if you can, ch and, and that those are that's a deterministic system, albeit a very complex one. And so, if you simply change the rules, given some 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 outcome that happened, you can generate the counterfactual by just seeing what would have happened under that different set of rules. And finally, the models. Uh, uh, appear on various levels of the hierarchy, and we can think of models as just bags of assumptions, right? So we think in raw assumptions terms, uh, uh, statistical modeling assumptions, parametric assumptions uh, that we make in general statistical models. Let's, and now let's think about like uh, kind of graphical models, generative models. Uh, so vanilla probabilistic graphical models, topic models, latent variable models, oftentimes just directed models where causality is maybe a little bit suggested, but not really assumed formally. Uh, uh, on the interventional level, uh, DAGs themselves, these are just kind of uh, bags of assumptions of what causes what. Um, relatedly, con conditional independence-based assumptions, things like when people say ignorability and in, in, in potential outcomes, that's, that's what they mean there. Uh, and then in, a, in a, a graphical generative case, so any kind of causal, uh, any generative model that we fit on top of the DAG, so a, I'll call that a causal graphical model, um, you might call that a causal Bayesian network. And then finally, on the counter, on the, in, in counterfactual land, uh, level three, any assumption beyond the DAG, so any assumption about the causal system, the causal mechanism that... Um, uh, about how, not just what causes what, but that you, which you can capture in a DAG, any assumption beyond the DAG, how what how X causes Y, how a variable causes another variable that you can't see specifically in a DAG is an additional assumption. We'll call that a level three assumption, right? So these can be a parametric assumptions, but not just parametric assumptions that we make for convenience and statistics. Like oftentimes we'll assume, we'll make a Gaussian assumption because it's a nice tractable assumption, but we don't actually assume that we're, we're working with a linear system. Um, but if you if you think that you're working in a causally linear system, right, like you're modeling, you know, X is the length of the femur and Y is the height of the individual. And, you know, based on, you know, just knowledge of human anatomy, that a increase in, in femur length is proportional to an increase in to a, to a measure. Uh, increase in height, right? That's a linear assumption, but it's a linear assumption that comes from your causal knowledge of the domain rather than some kind of uh, statistical choice for convenience. And um, similarly, so, I mean, talking to the PyMC, uh, PyMC crowd, the PyMC labs is this awesome set of tutorials on, on Bayesian media mix modeling. And uh, one of the kind of assumptions you make there is, is saturation that's, you know, eventually your investment in a media channel is going to saturate. You're not, you're gonna get minimum, you're gonna get diminishing returns on that investment. And decay effects that after somebody has been exposed to a uh, to a, to some um, communication from a media channel or some advertisement, for example, uh, the effects of that exposure decay over time, right? So these are domain based, like these are based on what people in this who do media who who work in this domain assume about about the uh, the domain that they're working in and they're incorporating that into the structure of the model that's a that's a level three assumption because it's reflecting reality as opposed to just you're not you're not you're not putting in these uh saturation curves and 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 other curve like uh, effects in your model for fun right you're putting it in the manner because they you feel like they reflect these these level three assumptions in a generative case Causal generative models, causal graphical models for level three assumptions. These are structural causal models. Um, I won't uh, with with priors on the exogenous variables. Uh, I won't I don't have time to go into exactly what those are if you're not familiar. But that's they are models that in in have a DAG, but they also have a specific uh, um, analytic representation, uh, um, analytical representation or functional representation of how X causes Y for every, you know, how each set of parents causes, the, causes their child. So 
given these generative models, we have various ways of implementing the atomic intervention. I call these intervention operators. Uh, so one is called graph mutilation. This is something that you might've seen in Daphne Kohler's book on probabilistic graphical models. Uh, and in probabilistic programming, we, we implement this as something I call atomic replacement. Uh, there's also something called the node splitting operation. Um, and I call that atomic insertion. And we'll see the examples of that. So graph, uh, so let's say I want to generate from the probability distribution of in-game purchases given an intervention that's, you know, uh, sets uh, engagement to high. In other words, I want to answer the question, what would in-game purchases be if, if uh, side quest engagement were high? And the way I do that with graph mutilation is I, so E is my intervention target. I'm going to uh, fix it to a value E equals high and cut it off from its parents. So in that atomic intervention, we separate the relationship from the parents. In the graph, that looks like I remove the edge from the parent to the child. And then I sam and then I sample or I generate from I sub E equals high in this, in this mutilated model. Now you can tell me, um, uh, Thomas, if this is uh, kind of how it works in PM. So this is this is uh, in, 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 in PyMC. Uh, this is what I'm guessing happens, uh, but uh, or something uh, akin to this, which is where you take in your original model. This is happening. This is kind of a uh, hand wavy demonstration, and uh, obviously this happens on the back end when you use uh, the do operator in in, Py, in PyMC. But you take this original sampling of side quest engagement from a distribution that's conditional on uh, guild membership, and you replace it with a deterministic uh, setting of that to a to an intervention value. Is that true, Thomas? Is that kind of what happens? Yeah, that's exactly right. Right, and so we're just so we're kind of I call this atomic replacing because we're replacing this sampling from a distribution to to uh, setting a value from a deterministic uh, kind of degenerated distribution where we have all the probability maybe set on one value. That's a probabilistic way of saying that we just replace it with a constant. Um, there's another thing called a node splitting operation. Uh, this is a bit kind of more nuanced where rather than just doing graph mutilation, we're uh, actually target the, the node itself that we want to intervene on. We, we kind of cut it in half, right? We, we split it. And what happens is that we maintain the original variable as a random variable, and then downstream of it, and it, and it keeps all of the parents of the original variable. And then we have a, a new constant um, uh, uh, on the other side of the split that maintains all of the children. And so this is pot with this um, approach, we can learn, we can infer, uh, Distributions like this, so these counterfactual distributions where the actual facts uh, overlap with the hypothetical conditions, not the outcome. It will not work for outcomes, but it works for hypothetical conditions and it requires a special assumption called a single world assumption. So you assume that it's possible to know. It, people do, for example, Pyro implements this, um, this operation. Um, uh, but you know you have to be careful with it because you're in you're making an assumption here that's often not obvious to people, which is that I call this a single world assumption, which is that it's you assume that it's possible to know what value the intervention target would have taken had you not intervened on it. So you're you're implicitly making that assumption when you when you when you take this technique. Um, and so what this looks like is rather than replacing this uh, sampling distribution given its parents, you're maintaining it. And then you're inserting a an interventional term below it, and then everything downstream of it works with the interventional term. So what this allows you to do is, con is still condition your model on, say, side quest engagement being one thing, but also setting an intervention that sets it to something else. So you can do you can infer queries like this. And then finally. Uh, so so, so I'll, I'll just call these kind of loop these together. Just call them a function called intervention generator, right? So that we apply this intervention op, uh, operator, either atomic replacement or assertion. We'll condition our model on some actual facts, that, you know, uh, some evidence, and then we'll run inference and generate samples. So this is our, well, before we talk anything about, we, we do anything Bayesian, this is the, the function that we're, this is the function that we were just, we're using to wrap this 
we're wrapping this uh, intervention operator in and conditioning on actual facts sampling from the uh, mute the model that's now been changed by the intervention operator. And uh, and then and then for for level three queries, anything that happens at, that at level three, including including things that condition on uh, counterfactuals that condition on uh, that that uh, condition on outcome. Um, we there's an algorithm that's going to require an, a, an SCM called the counterfactual inference algorithm. So we can look at that here. Um, what we're going to do is we have to reason over multiple worlds, um, or, or in this case, is two. Well, we'll focus on two worlds or, or twin world reasoning. We define uh, we have our original model. We're going to just clone it and create a hypothetical world. And this requires an SCM, which means it has exogenous variables. And all that means is that the endogenous variables, G, E, and I here, are set deterministically given the exogenous variables. I won't go too much into that, but you can, if you're not familiar, you can think of it like the reparameterization trick, where you, rather than sampling from a normal, you sample from, you sample a, um, a an error term from a normal distribution and then apply a linear, uh, and then you know, set a linear deterministic linear function that where the added, the error term is is added to that linear function. That's that's a way of uh, that you know, here that would this n here would be an error term. While g might maybe or maybe i here is sample from a, uh, a a a Gaussian, which is a linear function of e and the error term. And so, um, uh, so we're just we we kind of clone the model across worlds with the same kind of base exogenous variables. And there's something in causality called a consistency rule, which means that the in, initially, because the endogenous variables are deterministic functions of the exogenous variables, they have to be equal across worlds. Now, we're going to target a, a query here. We're going to say, you know, conditional on E being low and I being less than, and so in, uh, in side quest engagement being low and in-game purchases being less than 50, conditional on that. Um, Again, so this must be initially this must be low, and this also must be less than fifty before we 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 we've, we've done anything, right? We're just conditioning on this. We're going to infer the posterior distribution of the exogenous variables given the endogenous variables we observe, and then while and as we kind of store that information from the actual world in that posterior distribution of exogenous variables, the next thing we're going to do is implement a hypothetical the, implement the hypothetical condition in the hypothetical world, right? So here we're going to do graph mutilation, set e to high. And now this becomes i equal uh, i sub e equals high, right? So we've observed i is equal to 50 in the actual world, but now we're going to infer this i sub e equals high in the uh, counterfactual world, the hypothetical world. Um, finally, we're going to sample from uh, the posterior distribution of the exogenous variables, plug that into these deterministic functions and get the value of uh, uh, I sub E equals high in the, in the uh, hypothetical world, right? So we've, we, uh, so we, we, the first step is to, um, we call these three steps, the abduction, action, uh, prediction. So we, abduction is inferring the exogenous uh, posterior distribution of the exogenous variables, applying the intervention in the hypothetical world and then uh, generating from uh, the the, uh, the value the outcome of interest in the hypothetical world. So that's called the counterfactual inference algorithms. It it will infer any uh, counterfactual query of interest, uh, but it requires an SCM, which of course is the strong assumption. It means you know how everything causes what in your model. It's a pretty strong assumption. Or it, it actually, it's the strongest assumption possible for giving your DAG. Um, so now we have two algorithms for causal inferences on a graph. One is the intervention generator. One is the counterfactual inference algo. Now let's let's add in the Bayes, right? So uh, first, we'll start with kind of uncertainty over parameters. We're going to put parameters over all of our uh, sorry. We're going to put priors over all of our parameters in the model. And then nothing really changes here. Now we're just going to do what we usually do in Bayesian inference, which is uh, uh, infer a posterior distribution on the parameters, sample, and then sample parameters, and then apply the intervention generator conditional on each uh, 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 parameter sample. 
right? And so, uh, so what's happening is that we're sampling values of of in-game purchases uh, sub, uh, you know, what in-game purchases would be uh, given uh, high side quest engage engagements. In other words, um, uh, samples of in-game purchases from the interventional distribution uh, given high side quest engagement. And uh, and then each one of those samples is conditional on some parameter sampled from the posterior. So in other words, we're sampling our causal inference from the posterior predictive distribution. Same thing with our with our counterfactual, right? We just sample from sample parameter, apply our um, um, our, our counterfactual inference algorithm, and uh, 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 sample from the uh, target distribution. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about identification. So this is the this all, everything that I've talked about is great. We now know how to uh, just kind of run these, take these kind of causal inference algorithms for, that take an intervention op operator and apply it to a graph, and, and then we do for, and we do sampling. Maybe if we have, if we condition on evidence, we do inference, and then we do sampling. Um, but the problem is, like, do we know that this is going to give us the right answer? And the trick is that we we don't because we need to understand whether or not the causal query that we have identification for a certain causal query. Identification requires some definition. So in ordinary kind of statistics, statistical estimation theory, it just if we don't have identification, it means that your estimation procedure is not going to converge to the estimate, the thing you're actually trying to infer, the parameter if you're a statistician as your data increases. So what you hope if you're in statistics is that as you get more data, your inference procedure converges to the true value of the thing you're trying to estimate. Similarly in, in, in Bayes, right? That our inference procedure uh, is going to converge to, we get a posterior distribution. And if we're, if we're looking at a point estimate, then uh, if, we're, if we're inferring a point value, uh, then our, we'll get a posterior distribution. And as we increase data, that posterior is going to collapse to that point value. If we're inferring, a, if we're actually inferring a distribution, then our, we're going to converge in distribution to the target distribution. Um, now, causal identification is the same thing, except it, it works across the levels of the hierarchy. In other words, we're, we're interested in some query at level K. In other words, for example, level two, this interventional distribution of an in-game purchases given high side quest engagement. We have a level K causal model, for example, a DAG, right? So a level two model here would be a DAG. Question is, can you identify an estimand, something that we can estimate from level one data in this case, uh, uh, in other words, is there something from a from observational data that's a level one that's level one data uh, that we can uh, we can use to equate to a level two query, given the assumptions in our level two model? So in this case, yes, there is one. For example, might be the backdoor estimate, which you might have heard of, and the backdoor adjustment. Right? We get this. This is a an operation that we apply to the probability distribution of i, e, and g that is equal given our DAG to uh, this, this thing here. And it requires a proof to show that, and we have tools for doing identification proofs, but that's, that's what it is. Identification means I want this, and so I identify this. This thing exists, and I can estimate it from P of I, E, and G, the joint probability distribution of the data. And if you don't have it, then you can't refer your causal query even with infinite data. And this is particularly kind of onerous to us Bayesians because it means because our, our algorithm might run, right? We like run M, we run HMC or whatever, you know, stochastic variation or inference, whatever our algorithm is, and we it converges and we get answers, we draw samples, but the samples aren't actually converging to our uh target distribution. And you're not necessarily going to see that by looking at the trace plot sort of uh so your predicted distribution. You're just gonna you're gonna see uh you're, you're without ident without causal identification, you're gonna be sampling junk. Now, in terms of you know, how do we find things like you know how do, where do we even get this formula right? How do we say like given my DAG and my data and this query, I get this thing? Where does that where does this thing come from? Uh, there are there are various approaches. There's do calculus. There's potential outcomes calculus. There's all kinds of things that you can use to do it. It's largely been algorithmized, at least the ones that we can do with graphs. Right. So, for example, there's a library called Why Not in Python, another one called CFID in R, uh, that will take uh, graphical uh, rules like the Do Calculus, uh, 
uh, use this kind of recur recursive algorithm to uh, to actually generate these expressions for us, right? So here, for example, is my model I'm implementing in Why Not, uh, create, a, uh, create my DAG. So guild membership, side quest engagement, uh, in-game purchases, one items. And I'm interested in this. So let's suppose that I, I don't ob ob uh, observe guild membership. I only observe in-game purchases, side quest engagement, and one items. I'm interested in, in the probability distribution of in-game uh, in purchases given the intervention on in uh, uh, side quest engagement. This is what that at sign here means. It means an intervention. And I say, okay, we'll identify this. And it gives me this formula here, which is the front door estimate. It's, uh, it's a lot of summations here, but it, it but it works. It just means that there is a way of estimating uh, this distribution of interest, inferring this distribution of interest from these disjoint distribution of observational variables. And so now, if I want to apply these inference algorithms in a graphical sense, I need to make sure I have, generally speaking, I want to make sure I have identification. And so, you know, I have this kind of plate model, I have n data samples, I, I have my, I, I have parameters set with a prior. If I can, if I can condition my model on all of these, um, I added this extra variable here, but if I can condition my model on all these observed variables, uh, I have identification. So that's, that's a given. Let's suppose I don't observe one items and I, but I do observe guild membership. Well, I can uh, even know that this is a latent variable. I can infer my 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 kind of causal inferences are going to work given my algorithm. If I observe guild membership, what happens is that this just becomes a an estimator for the backdoor estimate. Similarly, if I don't observe this back these these common cause this common cause guild membership, it's a latent variable in my model. I, I so I put a prior on its value and I infer it given just the joint probability distribution of E, W, and I, um, and the and the priors and the parameters. This will work too if I if I observe uh, one items. There is like I there is if I have this mediator here, it is identified using something called front door identification. But if I don't observe either this or this, um, then I'm out of luck. I will, I can I can train a latent variable model that will infer guild membership and one items, and it will you know it, it could sample those in the posterior, but I will not get convergence to the probability distribution of I given an intervention on E. Jump ahead here. Uh, oh, going backwards. Uh, now, identification, while it's a bit intimidating, is also actually, uh, it, it can be intuitive for us Bayesians if we think about it in terms of, mm, uh, as a casual model, causal model uncertainty. So identification, one way of thinking about identification or, or lack of identification means that there are multiple causal models that are consistent with the data from the lower level of the hierarchy, so observational data, you know, for if you're looking at level two or level three queries, or experimental data if you're looking at a level three query, um, uh, but it would produce different inferences, causal inferences at level three. So if I'm interested in uh, inter interventional distribution, there could be there's multiple lack of identification means there's multiple causal models that would give me the same that encode that entail the same observational distribution at level one, but different interventional distributions. So I have multiple models. I don't know which model is the right model. So I call that we call that an equivalence class. That they're equivalent at one at one level, but different at a different level. But for me as a Bayesian, I'm just saying, oh, that's just that means that's just model uncertainty, right? I'm uncertain, I'm uncertain as to which model of the equivalence class is the right model. And Bayesians handle uncertainty by assigning priors. So if we can construct a prior over members of an equivalence of, of a class of models, then we can just deal with lack of identification as another source of uncertainty in, our, in, in, in a Bayesian sense. So to give an example, uh, each of these DAGs below here, they all entail, so putting away one item, just looking at guild membership, side quest engagement, in-game purchases, they all entail a different factorization of this joint distribution, right? And so uh, in other words, that given data from this, Distorted distribution, observational data of G, E, and I, uh, they're all um, they're all going to have the same data likelihood of of uh, of, uh, 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 of the model, right? So the, the models are all going to be equally likely in the data, 
Um, but they're all going to have different interventional distributions of in-game purchases, right? So in this case, if I intervene on E, it's going to affect I. But if I intervene on E on this model, it's not going to affect I because in this model, I is a cause of E, right? So that we have different, different inferences of this query, but the same likelihood under this distribution. And so, uh, but as Bayesians, we can say, nah, no problem. I'm just going to assign a prior to all of, you know, where I'm going to assign a different prior probability to each one of these possibilities based on my causal domain knowledge. So it has to be, you want it to be an informed prior that, that incorporates causal information. And then, and then you sample your prior, your model from the posterior, as well as the parameter, parameterization, apply your intervention generator, your counterfactual inference algorithm, and infer your, your target query, right? So in other words, when we generate both the, uh, the parameter and the model and apply our, our intervention operator uh, to the, um, uh, to the uh, uh, parameter and the model. So again, so as a Bayesian, um, uh, we want to construct prior over members of, the, of an equivalence class. Now, most times our equivalence class is going to be much larger than this. So we need uh, we need clever ways of in, of encoding those priors. And so, like, I think you know, if, if I want to end with some future directions, that's where we want to go, right? So I want to say, like, you know, going back to that media mix model, we say, like, okay, well, how do I how do I encode a prior on my belief that there's ad decay and saturation. So given, so I have some kind of prior over structural cause and models. And I want to infer a question like, what would happen if um, uh, I were, you know, given my, I, 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 I had this media mix and got this amount of sales, what would have happened had I used a different mix? That's a counterfactual question. Um, I want, there's lots of models that are SEMs that are going to be consistent with my data. But if I can kind of, put in some level three causal assumptions that are going to favor some SCMs over other ones, then I can actually reduce uncertainty, uh, that model uncertainty uh, uh, and, 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 and kind of, and, and get closer to a, a, a correct answer. So the question would be then, well, how do I write a prior over that allows me to incur, encode my assumptions about ad decay and saturation? That's it. Um, I hope that was useful. Um, and, Ready for questions? Do you have any? That was awesome. Thank you. Um, so there are a few questions. I um, got to start with mine. Uh, as we talked about earlier about combining this with LLMs, and there was this recent insight I've gotten about how or why they work is in the main training stage, right? They just learn how to predict the next words and. The insight for me was that in that um, in in those probabilities um, of how, which words um, commonly occur with which other words is an implicit word model, right? About like facts of the world and might not be causal, right? But it does um, have a, a lot of information in it, and that basically LLMs just learn from this like uh, terabytes of text data, um, a lossy compression of how these things relate to each other. So it sounds like um, that could be interesting in generating these hypotheses, right? So even with just like three nodes, already the space of like storing all potential um, uh, causal graphs is gonna be cumbersome, but then yeah, if you have hundreds, uh, it, it'll just explode. So do you think that that could be used for um, generating uh, essentially constructing a prior over different causal models uh, that is informed by that world model from the LLM. Yeah, I mean, I, you could always say, for example, so I gave the example of the of media mix model. I could, I, I, if I went into chat GPT and I said, um, uh, Give me a media mix model, a structural causal model for a, a, a uh, for uh, for media mixtures that uh, incorporates ad decay and and, and saturation. Um, it'll give me something. Um, you know, you you probably want to constrain it a bit more. Maybe you could ask it for. Um, 
I mean, you could constrain it a lot and say, well, I want a Gaussian process prior. Can you give me that? And it will do that. But maybe you want to be a bit more flexible than that and just kind of figure out a prompt that's, uh, you know, and, and that would give you um, uh, different variations of that model structure that you're interested in. Uh, and, and you'd want to do that. Maybe you want to, you know, there's a lot of tools coming out now that constrain the large language models to kind of generate things that fit to a specific um, uh, fit, the fit, fit consistent uh, uh, certain constraints. So, for example, you can imagine like you would just write an accept reject algorithm that would reject any sample from the distribution from the large language model that didn't fit certain parameters. You know, they didn't compile, for example, or it wasn't syntactically valid, and or had certain things. So you can there's all kinds of things you can do there. But I think that's 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 definitely where I've been leaning, which is like okay, it is very awkward. Like one of the advantages that causality has is it's not hard to ask people to write their assumptions in the form of a DAG. Uh, and even even when, even though that's true, it, people tend to be a little bit unco uncomfortable with it. I call it DAG anxiety. But you know, imagine how much harder it is for a Bayesian to encode their, their uh, knowledge about the world as well as lack of knowledge about the world in the form of a prior. Um, and so we have like prior predictive checks and all kinds of ways of, 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 of testing your prior assumptions, but it's, it's just it's just not natural for me to say, here's what I know about this thing and here's the corresponding beta distribution, right? And so like uh, a large language model might be able to help that by saying like, okay, we're not having to work with, um, you know, the only reason we work with canonical distributions is because we actually have code that can implement them, right? But if we didn't have to work with a canonical distribution, we can just say it's a bell shape and it has long curve and long tails and it does this and that. And we didn't have to write it down mathematically, we'd be happy with that. And the large language model can can do that to some extent, although I think we need to, you know, write some papers about it first. <laughs> right, yeah. Um so an audience question, Matt Smith asks, uh, what was the book on probabilistic graphical models? So yeah, I think towards the halfway point, you were like, Oh yeah, that that book. Uh, mm -hmm. Daphne Kohler has a book. Uh, uh, so her name is D-A-P-H-N-E-K-O-L-L-E-R. Um, uh, uh, book on probabilistic graphical models. She also has a uh, very famous Coursera course on it. Um, Thomas asks, are you aware of any work that connects the Bayesian literature, model feedback, and cut posteriors together? With the, uh, sorry, and cut posteriors together with the causal graph literature and graph modulation. You repeat that? I don't know. Yeah. Um, work that connects the Bayesian literature on model feedback and cut posteriors together with the causal graph literature and graph modulation. Hmm. Not that I'm aware of. I can, uh, I, can, I can do some Googling, but I haven't seen the connection before. Ask the LLM, generate some hypotheses. Um, Zordo asks, how does one approach solving causal questions when the graph is cyclic? There are cyclic um, uh, causal models. So there, are, there are cyclic structural causal models um, are free to work by uh, Joris Moich. Uh, has a few papers on uh, cyclic uh, structural causal models. Um, you'll find you'll find a few in Pearl's book as well. Um, uh, and I mean, I, I typically think of them as uh, when, when when you have a cycle, is essentially you're saying that there's kind of a a feedback loop. Um, uh, but but most of the time, when we think about causal models, we're assuming uh, either that we're dealing you know, you can you can work with a feedback loop, but that there's some kind of equilibrium distribution. Uh, uh, and if not, then you would just use a dynamic causal model. So in other words, a model where there's a, you know, a subscript for time on each variable. Um, so, you can just, and so you can just, essentially, if you just want to use kind of traditional approaches, you can just unravel them over time. Like you would have like a, you would implement like a NHMM. Really. Yeah. I guess ODE models also go in that direction. Um, and Ronald asked, uh, I keep hearing about Pearl's do notation. Can you recommend a resource for learning about it? 
I would um, sort of do notation is just, uh, just uh, am I still sharing screen on that? Um, oh, you just stopped. Let me try this here. You know, so if I wrote probability of uh, y given, I write this as a So this is just equal to probability of y given do x equals one. Um, and so that's the notation for using do. Uh, the problem with the do notation is that when you want to talk about queries like um, say this one, it doesn't work. It just uh, the notation uh, becomes uh, cumbersome. So this I, I wrote. So I wrote. Uh, uh, so this is Perl's causal notation. It's um, it, it, it is also invented by Perl, it, and he you know this is the per, this is the notation he introduced when you know if you want to work with um, if you want to work with kind of um, queries from all three rungs of the causal hierarchy, you, it, it's easier to work with this than to work with this, but they're equivalent. I see. And if the um, question was about the do calculus. The do calculus are three rules for making it, you know, uh, it's different from the notation itself. It's just, these are rules for, they're essentially the rule, there's three rules and they say like, you know, um, if these set of nodes are independent of that set of nodes and a graph where these edges are removed, then this query is equal to that query. It's just three rules that just have of that exact shape and they're used to do the, to do proofs for identification, in other words, derive things like the back door and front door estimate, and you can use this library. This, so this library here, uh, why not? And as well as CFID and R, it implements uh, the do calculus on the back end, as, you know, as part as as ingredients that are used in a graphical identification algorithm. And uh, and so, like, if you go through their tutorials, they'll have a whole, they'll talk about the do calculus and how they're they're implemented here. But I, you know, personally, I like learning. You know, the do calculus when you read about them in a book is just kind of opaque. It's like, you know, they're rules for doing proofs, right? So, if for example, um, when you learn geometry, sure, like uh, uh, if you, it's, it's easy when you say like, okay, well, uh, a square has all ninety degree. Uh, angles, right? Like, that's easy. You kind of see that intuitively, right? But if I tell you like, you know, cosine squared X plus sine squared X equals one, right? You're like, it doesn't, that, that's true, but you kind of memorize it, right? You don't just, I mean, maybe if you're a, a math whiz, you just kind of hear it and you're like, oh, of course, cosine squared X plus X sine squared X equals one, but it's just the rule that you derive. The do calculus are these, are just three rules like that, that are used to do proofs in the same way cosine squared X plus uh, sine squared X plus equals one is used to do uh, geometry proofs. And so those, and, and you can learn them, but honestly, they're implemented for you in libraries like this. So, and so kind of working with libraries like this is kind of try different stuff is probably the best way to, to kind of in, internalize them as opposed to just kind of reading a book about it and, and, and staring off into space. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I found quite difficult is a, a lot of it is very theoretical and um, and not all that applied. And that's what I really liked about your examples here. Uh, and for me, that really gave me new insights into how careful you could really construct these counterfactuals with like um, this, this sort of querying of like, oh, well, we intervene and uh, we condition on these different things and then intervene here and what if. So it's much richer than I originally thought in terms of like the type of questions you can answer. So that I think makes it really powerful. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, well, that's all the time we have today. So thanks so much, Robert, for coming on. Um, and thanks everyone for joining and for the lively discussion. Thank you, Thomas, for having me. Bye.